friends, from the Christian perspective, there are few moments in human history more important than the Annunciation. After all, if one considers Christ to be the Savior of the world, what other moments aside from the Paschal Mystery and the Nativity could one name as being more important and central to the Christian life than the moment that the Son of God becomes incarnate and is conceived in the womb of Mary? I think you would be hard pressed to name another moment that is of such great import. And I want to suggest in this presentation that if we look at the dynamics of the Annunciation and specifically at the response and actions of Mary in this scene and, and then use it as a sort of launching pad to consider the other moments, some of the other moments of her life, we end up with a really clear paradigm of how the Christian life uh, ought to be lived. Uh, but in order to see that, it's important to have some background information ready at hand. And the first thing to say is that it's important to remember that Christianity is first of all a relationship. It's not a moral or ethical paradigm by which to live. There is a way of living that comes along uh, with being a Christian, we would say, and we'll talk about that in just a few minutes. But most fundamentally, Christianity is about relationship. And it makes a claim that Christianity, life lived with Christ, is the fulfillment of the human person who's been created in the image of God, right? We see in Genesis, then God said, let us make humankind in our image, according to our likeness. So God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. So we see in that passage that not only has the human person been created in the image of God, but according to the likeness of God. And therefore, we might say that the image of God has an inherent vocation, an inherent call to become like God, right? We see this in the Old Testament and the New Testament uh, alike, where our Lord calls us in his Sermon on the Mount to be perfect as our Heavenly Father is perfect. So in the end, what we have in Christianity is a relationship that entails those who have been baptized into the life of Christ, becoming adopted sons and daughters of God, or we might say members of the family of God. And we see this in St. Paul's letter to the Galatians. He says, For in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, in order to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as children. And because you are children, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So Christianity is first and foremost about relationship where we become members of the family of God and are able to call God Father uh, as we were intended to from the beginning. Consequently, to live as a member of God's family right, is to live as the other members of that family live. If we think about a family, family members often have the same mannerisms, the same way of life, the same customs. So too with Christianity, right? Christianity's way of life, we might say, is familial. And therefore, it calls us to a life of imitation of the other members of that family. Family members look like each other, right? Uh, St. Gregory of Nyssa gets at this, right? When he says that Christianity or the Christian life is at its core an imitation of God, right? an imitation of the head of this family, God the Father. He writes in on what it means to call oneself a Christian. If, therefore, someone puts on the name of Christ, but does not exhibit in his life what is indicated by the term, such a person belies the name and puts a lifeless mask in accordance with the model proposed to us. For it is not possible for Christ not to be justice, not to be and purity and truth and estrangement from all evil, nor is it possible to be a Christian that is truly a Christian without displaying in oneself a participation in these virtues. If one can give a definition of Christianity, we shall define it as follows. Christianity is an imitation of the divine nature. If we attend to the figure of Mary in the scene of the Annunciation, what we're going to see is that 
the grace of God won by the passion of God's only begotten son gave grace to Mary such that she was able to live in participatory imitation of God. And that same grace enables us to do the same. Now that word participatory on the screen, I've italicized because it's not a simple mimicking or external imitation of God that we're after here, right? So it's not just that God does something and we mirror it. That does happen, but it's participatory in the sense that we partake or participate in Christ's life and therefore, right, imitate his life. An external imitation doesn't do us any good. A participatory imitation draws us further in to Christ's life. And if we attend to what Mary does at the Annunciation, we'll see how we can do uh, just that. So from the Catholic perspective, Mary is both mother and exemplar. We might even say exemplar par excellence of the Christian life. But this all starts with Mary's discipleship of Christ. Right? So you see St. Augustine of Hippo in one of his sermons on the screen. He says, she did. Yes, of course, Holy Mary did the will of the Father. And therefore, it means more for Mary to have been a disciple of Christ than to have been the mother of Christ. It means more for her an altogether greater blessing to have been Christ's disciple than to have been Christ's mother. That's why Mary was blessed, because even before she gave him birth, she bore her teacher in her womb. Now, it's, it's important to be careful of what Augustine's saying here. It's not that Mary is more blessed because she followed Christ in the way that we as disciples follow Christ, but in the sense that her discipleship of Christ beforehand actually enabled her to conceive Christ in her womb, right? So in that sense, her discipleship has temporal priority over her becoming the mother of Christ because the yes has to come um, before, or indeed does come before the conception. So Mary's discipleship, we might say, or her attention and willingness to do the will of God with the help of God's grace enables her to become the mother of the Son of God by her fiat, by her faithful yes to God's will in her life. And Christ himself provides the same understanding of Mary, right? When told that his brothers and mother and sister wanted to, sisters wanted to see him, he says, who is my mother? Who are my brothers? And pointing to his disciples, he said, here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. And so has, that has some import for us, as we'll see as we move forward, especially in the conclusion. But it has an importance for Mary and understanding her life as well, right? This is one of the so-called hard sayings of Jesus with respect to Mary, right? It seems like he's almost, you know, giving her a, you know, a brush off, right? But that's not what's going on here. What does he say? Whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my mother and my brother and my sister, right? What he's doing then is making Mary's devotion and obedience to the will of God more important on a spiritual level than her biological conception and giving him birth, right? She is the mother of the Son of God in every sense, first of all, because she does the will of Christ's Father in heaven. Right? She is the one who first says yes to the will of God in Christ at the Annunciation. And therefore, even when it seems like Christ is giving her the brush off, he says, yeah, she is my mother. But she's my mother precisely because she said yes to God's will. And so you will be members of my family if you say yes to God's will in your life. So if Mary is the first disciple of Christ, she's also a faithful follower of the God of Israel to become incarnate with her. Those two things can't be separated. So when we look at Mary, we have somebody who is similar to John the Baptist in the sense that she is a bridge figure between the Old Testament and the New Testament, the Old Covenant and the New Covenant, just as John the Baptist is the last of the Old Testament prophets proclaiming the coming Messiah. Mary, too, is a figure who bridges and draws together and holds together, we might even say, the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. Right. Therefore, we will see that she looks like family members, right? Not just of this new Christian family, but she looks like her family members from the Old Testament. And most of all, she looks like and acts like and lives like 
her heavenly father and her divine son. Because of this, Mary is often referred to by patristic authors as the new Eve, as the mother of the Messiah who brings new life and salvation to the world, she represents a new beginning by giving him birth. She gives birth to the one that St. Paul calls the new or the last Adam, right? A new start for the human family. And Mary plays a crucial role in that by her yes. Right? By her yes to God in faith, Mary becomes the mother of God and consequently of God's adopted children in Christ, right? Those who make up the member of Christ's body, Christians, must also then share the same mother, right, by logical force. So here you say you see on your screen a statement by St. Paul VI uh, from 1964, where he says it's altogether appropriate to call Mary the mother of the church, right? mother of Christ's body. He says, daughter of Adam, like us, and therefore our sister, by the bonds of nature, Mary is nevertheless a creature preserved from original sin by the virtue of of the merits of Christ, and that to the privileges obtained adds the personal virtue of a complete and exemplary faith, meriting the evangelical praise, blessed are you because you have believed. In her earthly life, realize the perfect form of disciple of Christ, mirror of all the virtues, and incarnated the gospel beatitudes proclaimed by Christ, whereby the whole church, in her incomparable variety of life and works, finds in her the most authentic form of the perfect imitation of Christ. He then goes on to say, Therefore we wish, with the promulgation of the Constitution on the Church, right, Lumen Gentium, sealed by the proclamation of Mary, Mother of the Church, which is to say, of all the faithful and shepherds, that the Christian people be led with greater confidence and ardor of that most holy virgin, and pay her the devotion and honor that she is worthy of. Right, Devotion and honor for Mary, the mother of Christ, always entails being pointed in the direction of her son, right, in whom she received new life as well. As you see on in that quote from Paul the Sixth, right, it's Christ's grace that preserves her from original sin from the Catholic understand and in the Catholic understanding, and that animates her life fully, as we'll see. And if we tend to attend to Mary's life as a true mother, we'll see that not only does she give Christ's life to the world, literally, but she shows us how to live as he lives. So as I said at the beginning, we can see the in the Annunciation, I would suggest a paradigm of the Christian life in four steps. So we'll look at the Annunciation as a sort of jumping off point and then make sense of some of uh, the other pivotal moments in Mary's life. And when we bring those together, We'll get a paradigm of the Christian life that we can contemplate and live out by God's grace in four steps. So the first of that step is listening. We'll see that the whole thing begins with Mary's attentive listening. And the second is Mary's fiat, Mary's yes to God in faith, right? To live according to the will of the Father. Third is Mary's sacrifice, and this will find us at the foot of Christ's cross. Right? Mary's presence there indicates that not only is that sacrifice Christ's, she shares in it as well. And then fourth, Mary's action. We will go from the mirroring of the fiat and the cross and then think about uh, the visitation to Elizabeth in light of that mirroring dynamic. So first, Mary listens. And she listens contemplatively. Contemplatively, excuse me. Mary... When we first meet her at the Annunciation and the angel Gabriel appears to her, very quickly and easily moves into a dialogue with the divine. And we see, but Mary was much perplexed and pondered, that's a key word there we'll talk about in just a second, what sort of greeting this might be. So she's thinking about what the angel is saying to her very carefully and reflecting upon it. And then she asks this crucial question, how can this be since I'm a virgin? She wants to know how this is going to work. So she's not completely caught off guard by the angel Gabriel. She's surprised, but not overwhelmed or paralyzed. She listens attentively and engages him in a conversation. Mary here is making manifest the one who is called blessed in Psalm 119. We're starting to get a deeper insight into Mary's interior life here. Psalm 119 says, Happy are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. Happy are those who keep his decrees, who seek him 
with their whole heart. I treasure your word in my heart so that I may not sin against you. Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. I will meditate on your precepts and fix my eyes on your ways. I will delight in your statutes. I will not forget your word. This is precisely who Mary is, one who meditates on the word of God as she listens to it, that keeps it close to her, that treasures that word very intensely. In fact, we could go all the way as to say that to treasure and ponder God's word is simply Mary's way of life. Right? The gospel tells us this time and time again. So you see here on the screen uh, an example taken from the, the visitation of the shepherds at the nativity. So, so the shepherds went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the child lying in the manger. When they saw this, they made known what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured all these words and pondered them in her heart. We see something very similar uh, written of Mary in the second chapter of Luke's gospel, where we find uh, the scene of the child Jesus lost and then found in the temple. And so there's a couple of key terms here to take a look at. The first is treasure, and we see it both in the shepherd's visit and in Jesus's um, being found in the temple. A couple of variations of it in the Greek the first is suntereo, which means to keep close or to keep in mind. Or, and the next is the diatere, diatereo, which means to keep carefully or to hold fast. Right? Mary treasures, keeps these words close to her, these events close to her. And she's also said to ponder, and we see this both in the Annunciation and the, the Shepherd's Visit. And in the Annunciation, we find the Greek word for consider, to discuss, or to dialogue. And in the, the shepherd's visit, we, found, we find similarly the language for considering or discussing. And so Mary holds the word of God close, and not just for safekeeping, but to ponder it, to chew on it, right? to allow it to sink in and, and we'll see animate her. Right? That's why... It's always in her heart, right? In the ancient uh, Jewish tradition, the heart is the core of one's very being. So when we hear that Mary treasures and ponders the word of God in her heart, right? She holds those in the very core of her being such that it animates her whole life, right? This is the way Mary listens to the word. And so perfectly and openly does Mary listen to, to the word that the fathers of the church will say that Mary conceives through the ear, right? She conceives by responding to the message of God spoken by the angel Gabriel, right? You see there, Augustine says the angel makes the announcement. The virgin hears, believes, has faith in what is said and conceives faith in the mind, Christ in the womb. Joseph Ratzinger uses language that's even, we might say a little more startling or stark, when he says that Mary is pure hearing, he says in uh, Mary, the church at its source, Mary's divine maternity and her enduring attitude of openness to God's word are seen as interpenetrating here. Giving ear to the angel's greeting, Mary welcomes the Holy Spirit into herself. Having become pure hearing, she receives the word so totally that it becomes flesh in her. This understanding of hearing, meditation, and conception appears in conjunction with the concept and the reality of prophecy. Inasmuch as Mary hears in the very depths of her heart and the core of her being, so that she truly interiorizes the word and can give it to the world in a new way. And therefore, Joseph Ratzinger says, she is a prophetess, right? one who proclaims the word, and we'll see, proclaims the word with her whole life. We're asked to do the same, right? In the liturgy of the Eucharist, what comes first is the liturgy of the Word. We're asked to place the Word of God in our hearts, to hold them there, to treasure them, and to ponder them as we prepare to receive the life of the Word in the Eucharist. And from there, to embody that same Word, right, that we have attentively lis listened to by living His life. So Mary's fiat then, then Mary said, here I am, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word, right? Fiat mihi secundum verbum tuum, and the Latin. The Latin's important there because 
if we take a look at the Latin translation of the very first words spoken by God, the Father at creation in Genesis, we see God says, let there be light, and there was light. That word, let there be light, is fiat lux, right? let there be. Mary says, let it be done to me. God the Father had said, let it, let there be light. Mary's fiat also imitates Christ's fiat in the Garden of Gethsemane beforehand, where he says, Abba, Father, all things are possible to you. Remove this chalice from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. Okay. And the results here are analogous. Just as God the Father's fiat calls light into existence at the beginning from nothing, at the Annunciation, Mary imitatively echoes the fiat of God the Father and makes way for the true light of the world among us. And that true light of the world, by saying yes to God the Father, is going to give new life to the world through his Paschal mystery. So Mary's fiat then reveals not only her life, but the life of God acting in her. Just as God the Father was willing to give life at the beginning by saying fiat, let it be. And Mary's willing to participate in God's giving new life to the world through her own fiat. So her being animated by the grace of God reveals God's life to the world. Mary's yes then makes way for God's desire. It opens up a path for God's desire to work in the world through the incarnation of the only begotten Son. Therefore, Mary's yes is fruitful in a way analogous to God's yes, to God's let there be. The conception of the Son of God takes place right, following her yes by the power of the Holy Spirit. And thus, at this moment, we can say that because the church is the body of Christ, so too is the body of Christ conceived at the very moment of Mary's fiat. So we would say that Mary here is both mother of the church and the foundational or archetypal member, right? The exemplar par excellence of what it means to be a member of Christ's body. She utters what Hans Urs von Balthasar would say is the archetypal and foundational yes of the church. He says, and it really is a someone who, with perfect creaturely freedom, becomes the womb and bride and mother of the incarnating God. This someone's fundamental act is the act of receiving from God, who gives himself unconditionally the gift of receiving him unconditionally. The foundation of the church's Catholicity is this fundamental act that takes place in the chamber at Nazareth and in it alone. This Catholicity is the unconditional openness of the Ecce Ancilla. By giving God unlimited room beforehand is the creaturely counterpart of God's infinitely self-giving love. Those who think that the church started later with the vocation of the Twelve, for example, or with the bestowal of supreme authority on Peter, have already missed the heart of the matter. It's here where the whole thing starts. Right? Without this yes, nothing that follows takes place. That's what makes Mary's yes so crucial to salvation history. But we also see that it's by Mary's yes uh, given to God by God's grace operative in her that she enters most fully into the Trinitarian dynamics of love, right? So not only does Mary's fiat form the church's archetypal yes to God, but it reveals something fundamental about what it means to be a creature created in God's image, right? That it's a life to be offered back to God. It's received precisely to be given back, and thereby, in that gift exchange, the reception and the giving back, right? to be caught up in that Trinitarian dynamics of love, by where the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit give themselves completely and totally to one another from all of eternity. Right. So Ratzinger would say in Daughter Zion that Mary's fiat reveals the nature of the Imago Dei as completely responsive. Because Mary is entirely responsive, co-responsive, she cannot be understood where grace seems to be in opposition and response. The real response of the creature appears to be the denial of grace. Ratzinger is saying, if we think grace is an imposition on our freedom, that it inhibits our action and makes it something other than human, we're not going to understand Mary's yes here. We're not going to understand how it reveals the very core of what it means to be human. Right? 
Instead, Mary reveals that grace and free will are to be totally harmonious. And in fact, we might even go so far as to say that free will can't act properly apart from grace. He says, pure der derivation from God, and at the same time, the most complete creaturely complement, a creature that has become response. So too have all of us been created to be. The church then at the liturgy, each time it celebrates the Eucharist, imitates Mary's foundational fiat, right? By the same dynamics, the twofold action of the Holy Spirit within and then the presence seen of Christ in the Eucharist and then internalized in the reception of the Eucharist. So we can see these on the dynamics of the liturgy if we take a look at what Raniero Canta la Mesa calls a double epiclesis that takes place in the Eucharistic prayers, right? So we hear uh, in, in the, the Eucharistic prayers, make holy, therefore, these gifts, we pray, by sending down your spirit upon them like the dewfall, so that they may become for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, that calling down of the Holy Spirit upon the gifts of bread and wine, so that they might become transubstantiated, but then later on in the Eucharistic prayer, we hear something similar prayed for with respect to those of us gathered there as the body of Christ. Humbly we pray, the priest continues, that partaking of the body and blood of Christ, we may be gathered into one by the Holy Spirit. Right. So Mary is able to say yes by the grace of God working in, <clears throat> within her and through her. And that yes allows Christ to become incarnate in her, right? So the action of the Holy Spirit proceeds, and then the action of the Word. And we experience something very similar very quickly in our reception of the Eucharist. It happens so quickly that we can overlook its importance, I think, right? But St. Augustine highlights this moment where we respond, amen, amen, when we are confronted with the Eucharist. The Eucharist is held before us, and we hear the words of the body of Christ. He says, it is to what you are that you reply, amen. And by so replying, you express your assent, right? Your fiat, we might say. What you hear, you see is the body of Christ and you answer, amen. So be a member of the body of Christ in order to make your amen, they, that amen true. So what Augustine's saying here is that when we say amen, not only are we expressing an intellectual assent that, yes, I believe that that indeed is the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ. But amen in the sense that, yes, I will receive this so as to be the body of Christ in the world. Right? And this is exactly, so our, our amen is our fiat in the, the Eucharistic liturgy. And this is exactly what we pray for the grace to continue doing, right? To allow God's will to be done, right? Through us. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And that's what this encounter with Christ enables us to do in our reception of the Eucharist when we give that fiat, that amen. Yes, I will live as a member of the body of the one who I am receiving. Okay. So the celebration of the solemnity of the Annunciation takes place oftentimes, not without exception, um, and only with few exceptions during Lent. And we might ask, well, isn't this kind of strange? This, after all, is uh, the moment of Christ's conception. We're celebrating right in the midst of the season of fasting and penance that's going to lead up to the, the passion, the suffering, passion, and death of the Savior. But if we take a look at the dynamics and how we'll find a very close mirroring between what happens at the foot of the cross, we'll find that the celebration of the Annunciation during the season of Lent is altogether fitting and it prepares us, we might say, to enter into Christ's sacrifice more perfectly if we attend to Mary's actions, how she enters into that sacrifice. Mary's fiat doesn't just happen at the moment of the Annunciation when the angel Gabriel tells her that she has been chosen to be the mother of the Son of God, but it goes all the way to the end. And we see here that Mary's fiat describes her whole life. This yes to God describes her whole life. Just as we are told of Christ that he had loved his own to the end in John's gospel, Mary imitates that same love that Christ has 
to the same end. Right? John tells us, standing near the cross of Jesus or his mother and others with her. The Lumen Gentium right, talks about this, and we might say that Mary's presence at the foot of Christ's cross is actually the perfection of her fiat. It's the conclusion and the apex of her yes to God that will now bear fruit in an entirely new way, not just in the incarnate life of the Son, but in the lives of all who will share in that life through his Paschal mystery. After this, Lumen Gentium says, Manner, the Blessed Virgin advanced in her pilgrimage of faith and faithfully preserved, or persevered, excuse me, in her union with her son unto the cross, where she stood in keeping with the divine plan, grieving exceedingly with her only begotten son, uniting herself with a maternal heart with his sacrifice and lovingly consenting to the immolation of this victim, which she herself had brought forth. And Mary never protests. She follows Christ all the way to the end. And in some sense, in a real sense, right, she says yes to all that takes place, just as Christ says yes to God the Father, to all that takes place. We see in Mary's yes at the foot of the cross an analogy with Abraham. We're told in Hebrews, by faith, Abraham, when put to the test, offered up Isaac. He who had received the promises was ready to offer up his only son, of whom he had been told, it is through Isaac that descendants shall be named for you. He considered the fact that God is able even to raise someone back from the dead. And figuratively speaking, he did receive him back because of his willingness to sacrifice him. We also see an analogy in Mary's action with the mother of the Maccabean martyrs. Right? This woman... Uh, saw seven of her sons perish in the same day. And not only does she stand by right, and participate in this uh, martyrdom with them, but she encourages them to do the same. She says to them, I do not know how you came into being in my womb. It was not I who gave you life and breath. The creator of the world will in his mercy give life and breath back to you again, since you now forget yourselves for the sake of his laws. And all of these figures, Mary, Abraham, the Maccabean mother, they all imitate God the Father, God's willingness to offer his only begotten son for love of us. And by imitating that love, they express a loving desire of a child to be like their father. John 3.16 is the, the most famous passage here of God's love for us in the life of the incarnate son for God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. <clears throat> then Paul says in the eighth chapter of his letter to the Romans, if God is for us, who is against us? He who did not withhold his own son, but gave him up for all of us. Will he not with him also give us everything else? Mary stands at the foot of the cross and together with God the Father, and in imitation of God the Father, offers Christ up as a sacrificial offering for the love and life of the world. This is the perfecting and the concluding apex of Mary's fiat. During the sacrifice of the Mass, we do the same thing. If we attend to the Eucharistic prayers carefully, we see that we too are offering up, right, the life of the Son of God through, with, and in him to, uh, together with ourselves to the Heavenly Father at every Mass. The Eucharistic Prayer 1 says, Therefore, O Lord, as we celebrate the memorial of his blessed passion, the resurrection from the dead, and the glorious ascension into heaven of Christ your Son, our Lord, we, your servants and your holy people, offer to your glorious majesty from the gifts that you have given us this pure victim, this holy victim, this spotless victim, the holy bread of eternal life and the chalice of everlasting salvation. But it's not an only an offering of the life of Christ. It's an offering of ourselves individually and as an entire body of Christ to the heavenly father through, with, and in Christ. And we see this in the concluding doxology through him with and with him and in him. O God, almighty father in the unity of the Holy spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. And then the great amen follows. And this, I would suggest, is 
in the most concise way possible, descriptive of what human life was meant to be. A totally, totally receptive living, right? A receptive action, we might say, of giving the life that we've received back to the Heavenly Father through, with, and in the Son. That is what it means and what one is called to be as the image of God. And so at every Eucharist, we experience this fulfillment and apex of the human life as total sacrifice of love, just as Mary did at the foot of the cross. Okay, so if the Annunciation and Mary's fiat are mirrored and uh, completed and reach their apex at the foot of the cross, uh, Mary's action that follows the Annunciation also has something to tell us, right? And what does she do next? In those days, Mary set out, went with haste to a Judean town in the hill country where she greeted, where she entered, excuse me, the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. So the angel Gabriel had told Mary that Elizabeth was pregnant and Mary goes. That's what we're told happens next. She goes to care for Elizabeth. What is Mary doing here? We see Mary as one that we suggested at the beginning is completely animated by the word of God. Her first impulse is to live the covenant. And we see in Isaiah, learn to do good, seek justice, rescue the oppressed, defend the orphan, plead for the widow. And in Proverbs, whoever is kind to the poor lends to the Lord and will be repaid in full. Right? Mary's first instinct, right, after the Annunciation, isn't to focus on herself and what's just happened in her life, which is just mind-blowing and pivotal for the whole human family, but it's to care for one who is in need. We see then that the, the life of the Word animates her completely. It's what we have in the visitation is an imitation of God. Right? This is how God relates to the human family. Right? Psalm 12, because the poor are despoiled, because the needy groan, I will now rise up, says the Lord. I will place them in safety for which they long. The safety for which they long. Psalm 34, this, soul, this poor soul cried and was heard by the Lord. Psalm 33, again, for the word of the Lord is upright and all his work is done in faithfulness. He loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of the steadfast love of the Lord. Mary makes the steadfast love of God present to her cousin Elizabeth right, by giving herself again. So in this action of the visitation, Mary perfectly expresses the life that she now carries within her, quite literally, after having conceived the Son of God within by her fiat. It's important, I think, to consider for a moment how unusual Mary's action is here by worldly standards. How many of us, if we were told that we were going to be the mother of the Son of God, would do what Mary did? What would, would our first impulse be, well, I need to find somebody to serve, or I should go serve somebody else? Or would our first impulse be, well, I need to find people to serve me, because now I'm the most important person around, that is, at least until my son is born, right? Our natural impulse would be, how do we capitalize this? I'm very important now. But Mary's is just the opposite. How do I serve? Right? And we see then, that even before her son is born and lives and exemplifies the Christian life for her, Mary lives with the mind of Christ. She lives with the mind that Paul describes in the great Christ hymn of Philippians. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. Who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness. Mary does the same. Wouldn't we be tempted if we were told we were going to be the mother of God's son, to consider ourselves as moving just a little bit closer to equal with God, I think the temptation would certainly be there for us. And maybe only the best of us would avoid that, succumbing to such temptation. But Mary easily avoids it through her humble heart that's been formed by the word of God. She lives with the mind of Christ. Therefore, in the life of Mary, we see a kenosis that is analogous, we might say, or participates even in the kenosis of her son. Just as Christ empties himself as right, 
the Philippians, Christ him says, Mary does the same. And yet Raniero Cantalamesa says, Mary too had to go through her kenosis. Jesus's kenosis consisted in this. Instead of asserting his divine rights and prerogatives, he deprived himself, becoming a servant and appearing before all as a man, just like any other man. Mary does the same. Mary's kenosis consisted in the fact that instead of asserting her rights as the Messiah's mother, she let herself be deprived and appeared before the world as a woman, just like any other woman. Humility animates right, and is at the center of the life of Christ and exemplified by him and Mary alike. So she lives even before Christ teaches as he taught. He says, the greatest among you will be your servant. All who exalt themselves will be humbled and all who humble themselves will be exalted. Mary becomes the disciple of Christ par excellence by humbling herself. <clears throat> she is the greatest and first disciple of Christ by living the virtue of humility to the utmost. And this humility and humble life gives great glory to God. Right? Notice that Mary's Magnificat, that says her soul magnifies the Lord, follows upon this humble activity. Her humble obedience at the Annunciation, and then her humble loving self-sacrifice to Elizabeth at the Visitation. She prays, my soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior, for he has regarded the lowest state of his handmaiden. For behold, henceforth all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy, mercy is on those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He has put down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of low de degree. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. He has put down the mighty from their thrones and, ex and exalted those of low degree. Right. Mary's prayer already anticipates the teaching of Christ. Right. Those who exalt themselves will be humble and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Right. We see the same in the Christ hymn in Philippians that because Christ empties himself, God greatly exalts him and gives him a name above every other name that in Jesus' name every knee should bend. And every tongue professed to the glory of God the Father that Jesus Christ is Lord. Through her humility uh, that exemplifies and lives out the word of God, Mary too magnifies and glorifies God's life. We see another, or we hear echoes, we might say, of another relative from the Old Testament of Mary's, uh, Hannah. She has a very similar prayer, utters a very similar prayer when she learns that after much heartache of not being able to have a child, that she will have a child, right? Uh, and then it gives birth to the prophet Samuel. She says, my heart exalts in the Lord. My strength is exalted in my God. My mouth derides my enemies because I rejoice in my victory. And then see the similarity. The bows of the mighty are broken, but the feeble gird on strength. Those who are full have hired themselves out for bread, but those who are hungry are fat with spoil. The Lord raises up the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes and inherit a seat of honor. Now, a lot of people will look at this passage from the first book of Samuel in the Old Testament and say, well, Mary really never prayed the Magnificat. Luke is simply imagining what Mary might say um, based on this prayer that Hannah utters in the Old Testament. But remember that Mary is one who cherishes the word of God in her heart who treasures them and ponders them. And so it makes all the sense in the world that Mary would speak the language of Scripture, that she would speak with the words that she heard her ancestors speak when she meditated on the word of Scripture and heard it proclaimed in the synagogue. She allows those words to sink in so deeply that it animates her whole life and forms the way she lives and moves about and responds in any given situation. She's totally animated by the word of God that she now carries within her. So we are asked, too, to imitate the action of Mary in the dismissal. We hear, go forth, the Mass is ended, or go and announce the gospel of the Lord, right? which Mary does quite clearly in her Magnificat. And sometimes we hear, go in peace, glorifying the Lord 
by your life. This is a very biblical um, and evangelical dismissal. We hear Christ say something very similar in the Sermon on the Mount. He says, in the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven, right? When Mary responds to Elizabeth with her Magnificat, she doesn't say, look how great I am. But she says, look what God's doing. She points away from herself immediately and to God. It's never about her. It's always about God. That's the heart of the saint. That's the heart of one who is animated completely by the word of God. And to be truly animated by the life of God and by the word of God that communicates that life to us means to be a person for others. And that is a life that glorifies God. It participates and imitates that eternal exchange where the father is totally for the son. The son is totally for the father such that in that intensity, in that exchange of love, the Holy Spirit is spirated and binds them both. So intense is their love for one another. And if we are going to live with that life in us and hold it close to our hearts and allow it to animate us as Mary did, we must always be people for others. That is a life that truly glorifies God. In the end, we see that Mary is truly a Eucharistic woman. And we can think here of Michelangelo's great Pietà. In Italian... That word means compassion, a cold passion or a suffering with. And that Italian word, pietà, is rooted in the Latin word for piety. What does piety mean? Piety, most basically in Roman antiquity, expresses the love of a child for their father. In Christianity, that's come to take on the meaning of a religious duty or a practice. And these two meanings fit together perfectly in Christianity, right? Our religious duty, our religious life and practice and the sacraments and our prayers and our life of devotion is done for the love of the Father, through, with, and in Christ always. That's what we see in Michelangelo's Pieta, a life given completely out of love for God. St. John Paul II talks about Mary's Eucharistic faith in his encyclical Ecclesia, the Eucharistia. He says, in a certain sense, Mary lived her Eucharistic faith even before the institution of the Eucharist by the very fact that she offered her virginal womb for the incarnation of God's word. The Eucharist, while commemorating the passion and resurrection, is also in continuity with the incarnation. At the Annunciation, Mary conceived the Son of God in the physical reality of his body and blood thus anticipating within herself what to some degree happens sacramentally in every believer who receives under signs of bread and wine the Lord's body and blood. This is what we have depicted by Michelangelo in the Pieta. It's a very, very Eucharistic image, right? This is certainly Mary at the foot of the cross, but it's also Mary at the incarnation, or it harkens back to the incarnation. Look at the image on your screen. See that Mary is just as big or not bigger than Christ, which is very strange. Christ by now would have been a full-grown man, 33 years old. But Mary's depicted as the same size or larger. Michelangelo is hearkening back to the Annunciation that Mary once carried Christ in her womb right, and held her, carried her within as the new Ark of the Covenant. It also depicts Mary as mother of the church or as a type or a figure of the church as well. It's the church that carries the life of Christ within now, right? It makes that life present to the world. And as you see in Mary's hands, offers that life to the world through its own life, right? Mary's gesture here is very Eucharistic. If you look closely at the image, you'll see that in her right hand, where she embraces Christ. She doesn't directly touch Christ's skin. Right? The cloth is between her hand and his body. Very evocative of a Eucharistic dynamic, right? We're very reverent with the Eucharist. And in times past, no one would touch the Eucharist save the priest. And in her left hand, Mary says, 
take. This is the body of Christ given for love of the world. Right? John Paul II says then, if we read what we have in his encyclical Ecclesia, the Eucharistia, in light of that image of the Pieta from Michelangelo, right, to live a life of piety is to live a life that imitates Mary, to allow Christ to live in us and then offer that life to the world through our own lives. We are called then, Mary's life suggests, to be a Eucharistic people. If she is the archetypal figure, the exemplar par excellence of what it means to live as a member of Christ's body, we are to imitate and become Eucharistic people. Paul calls us to do this in his letter to the Romans. He says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds, which he characterizes in Philippians as putting on the mind of Christ, so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Mary does the will of God and is obedient to the will of God at the fiat all the way to the foot of the cross, imitating Christ every step of the way in her self-sacrificing love, we're called to do the same and in their, and thereby become a living sacrifice to our Heavenly Father through, with, and in Christ. What Mary teaches us then is that the life of the human creature as the Imago Dei, the image of God, is meant to be fiat, a let it be, let it be done to the will of God. And when it is, Right? We've come to discover in light of our reflecting on the Annunciation, other scenes from Mary's life in light of the Eucharistic liturgy. The life of the Son of God lives in and through us, and we offer his life to the world once again. Right? So we can say then that a life of fiat becomes magnificat. St. John Paul II says in Ecclesia the Eucharistia later on, the magnificat expresses Mary's spirituality. And there is nothing greater than this spirituality for helping us experience the mystery of the Eucharist. The Eucharist has been given to us so that our life, like that of Mary, may become completely magnificat, a life that magnifies the glory of God. If you want a life that becomes a monstrance, something, a life that holds within and exposes the life in the presence of Christ to the world, just as a monstrance holds the Eucharistic host for all to see. So too we become when we imitate the life of Mary. So in the end, we imitate Christ. We imitate the life of God if we attend to and imitate Mary. How do we do that? First of all, we must become excellent listeners of the, God, the word of God. That means spending time with scripture in the way that the Eucharistic liturgy instructs us, not just Right In the 10 minutes or 15 minutes that we're at the Eucharistic liturgy once a week. Right? But daily, spending time daily with the word of God, allowing it to penetrate into our hearts just as it did with Mary. To treasure it in our hearts so that we become excellent listeners of God's word and allow that word to animate us. I think one good uh, sort of self-diagnostic check here on how good of a listener we become with respect to God's word is to think, do we ever, or how often do we think in terms of scripture when we're making a decision? Do we say, oh, right, in this situation, so-and-so from scripture acted this way, I should too. When something good happens to us, like at the Annunciation, do we say, oh, what can I take advantage of or what can I gain from this position? Or do we say, how can I serve others with this position would be one example. The more often that we think in those terms, right, in scriptural terms, is a good sign that we become a better listener of the word of God, a listener similar to the quality of listener Mary was. But if we don't think that way, if when we're making important decisions and even everyday decisions, right, we're not calling to mind scripture, then we need to work on it. That's the first step. And then 
hand in hand with that is to strive to live in complete openness to God's will. That's what the simple exercise of meditating on God's word does to us. It cultivates within us a posture of openness to God's will, to be ready always to receive it so as to become completely translucent to it so that God's will is manifest in and through our lives. But we need grace to do that. We can't do that on our own steam. And therefore, we should participate regularly and frequently in Christ's sacrifice in the Mass. And that's going to give us the grace. And it's also going to give us additional practice in offering ourselves through, with, and in Christ to the Heavenly Father with our with the whole of our lives. Right? The more often we do this, we will receive the grace and we'll become more practiced in living our whole life that way. And so that's step four, to live the sacrificial life of love that flows naturally from the Eucharist. And the result will become Eucharistic people. And we can say we become spiritual mothers and fathers right? in two senses. Because in one sense, we're going to give life to the world by allowing Christ to live in and through us. And as we do, we're going to invite others into deeper communion with Christ. And we offer Christ to the world as Mary is depicted as doing by Michelangelo's beautiful Pieta. So. That's all I have for this time around. I thank you very much for listening. Thanks, Thanks for, for listening. listening. If you enjoyed this, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. And visit our website, freshimage.org, to become a Fresh Image Insider and have our latest resources delivered directly to your inbox. Until next time, this is Fresh Image, reminding you that you were created to live life to its fullest. So that you might be a breath of God's fresh, life-giving air to the world.